Thank you very much for that much appreciated introduction. I uh, hope I don't get a feedback here. Can you all hear me okay? <clears throat> I, I know I take, it's a great trepidation to be following behind Don Williams on anything. Everybody say we look alike, but we're not. I know whites think like we're all black folk look alike, but we're not. And Don Williams has absolutely no kinship to me. <laughs> it is customary at any auspicious occasion such as this one to recognize those individuals who are particularly germane to the occasion. So I take this opportunity to represent and speak to those people who are most important here today. That's all of you all that are here, sitting here. Let me say good afternoon to each and every one of you, both individually and collectively. And I also want to express my profound gratitude to Don Williams for having invited me to be your speaker today and offer some remarks to you. And, uh, but I must tell Don up front, I, it's, I'm not accustomed to and I tend to avoid speaking to mixed groups for a lot of very specific reasons. I don't usually accept speaking engagements where you have black and whites together or, or Democrats and Republicans or, or uh, different uh, ethnic groups. I do it for a very specific reason. After having been with governors, been a chairman for a board of governors for economic development for eastern and southern states, having been assistant secretary in the United States Department of Commerce, representing the president of the United States and taking trade missions, I learned something. I learned it out at Fred Price's church one Sunday, and speaking at his church, when one, of the woman, one woman was helping me write his book and an introduction to it, and she said, Dr. Anderson, she says, I'm white. She said, but whenever you come to our church and give speeches, she said, it just grates and goes to the bone to us. And I said, why? She said, because as a white person in, in Price's church, we don't want to hear about racial issues. She said, hurts us, or most of my friends who are white, we don't want to come to church on the Sunday mornings when you're going to talk about racial issues. She said, I said, but don't you know black folk have a problem? She said, yes, I know they got problems, but we can see how badly they live. I said, but don't you want us to address those issues? She said, no, not really. I said, what you want then is for black folk to suffer in silence. That's about it. She said, yeah, in a way. So I found out at that point that nobody really wants to hear about black problems. But so even so this day, when I speak to a mixed audience such as this one, I'm going to ask you to humbly forgive me in case if I offend you or hurt your feelings. And I want to ask you to do something for me in return. I want each and every one of you that is non-black in here to lift yourself outside of your skin, outside of your race. And for once say, I'm going to listen to some issues that speak specifically, directly to black folk and their problems. I'm going to do what nobody has done. It's not politically correct in this country to talk about black people and black issues. Nobody wants to hear about it. That's why you can't have black studies in any school. Nobody wants to hear about black folks' problems. That's what, they, they, keep it low, keep it quiet. Let's pretend that they don't exist. And so this day I'm going to ask all my non-black participants in this audience to please do me a favor and, and lift yourself out and just listen today and accept what I say. And if you disagree with me, and you have some objection to what I say and you feel offended, I apologize. But I don't want any of you to jump up and run home and say, I'm leaving, walking out, and he said, boo-boo. I don't want you to do that. But, I'm a, but we got problems in the black community and across black America. And when I speak about black issues and white issues, I'm not speaking about hate. I don't want black people to think that you should go out, they should go out and hate anybody. I don't want whites to think that blacks, by addressing black issues, that somehow black folk are getting ready to attack you and become all terrorists against you. What I'm saying right now is we got major problems, and that's why, that's why Don Williams asked me to be the speaker today. He says, come to this, our first meeting of our, our Black Chamber of Commerce and do two things for me. Primarily, address the state of black America, and two, give us some ideas and some hints that we uh, solution, put possible solutions for solving some of our problems in this city and in the country. I'm going to try to do that. And I'm going to start out first by telling you this. You cannot solve a problem. You can solve no problems on this earth unless you first of all understand the history of the problem. The first thing you do as a doctor, when a patient comes into your office, say, what is the history of the problem? Is it peculiar to your family or to your group or to your race? And so we're going to start out this morning trying to go after this, trying to understand black folks' problem in this society. You're black, and we got to go back to the history of it so you fully understand the nature of the problem. You have been misled and bamboozled in this country now for all these years into what the problems are. 
You have not heard the real problems in this country as it pertains to race. You're going to hear it today if you say it and don't walk out and get mad and get angry and say he's talking about boo-boo. Here's the problem. That historically in this society, black folk have not moved one eye older than where they were in 1860 on the eve of the Civil War. In, in, in a comparative pro proportional term, black people are exactly where they were on the eve of the Civil War. And even the Civil War, at that particular time, we had approximately 300,000 black people that were free in this country, or quasi-free, having come out of slavery. And that was out of 5 million black folk. And that 300,000 black people had mysteriously and miraculously accomplished and, and acquired one half, one half of 1% of this nation's wealth. Now here you are 150 years later and black people still only have and own one half of 1% of the nation's wealth after 150 years. Also on the Civil War, Eve 1860, we had black people right all over the country. That 300,000 spread out that was holding quasi free. I looked at the employment rolls. Almost 100% of all those blacks were working in someone's house, someone's plantation, enriching and bright, providing comfort for them. Here we are, 150 years later, 67% to 69% of all black people in America are working at some level of government. Another 26 or so percent of that, 27% is working in white corporations. Only 2% of the blacks in America are working in their own community for their own people. The unemployment rate in America for black folk is over 50%. When you hear them talking about the unemployment rate in America, they're talking about two things, those individuals who are looking for jobs or those who are collecting unemployment compensation. We have an institutionalized bunch of blacks in America that are no longer in the workforce. That's why five years ago, when Obama was running for office, they were talking about the unemployment rate in America for 16%. At that time, the national unemployment rate for black folk was 35%. It was 48% in Detroit, Michigan, 48% in Baltimore, 49% in Pittsburgh, 52% in New York, 88% for black youth. Now what does that mean for you in terms? There's only three things that any given individual can do to earn a living in our society. They either work up here and have a business or they have a job. They can't, don't have that, they must move down to the second level. When you move down to the second level, you must go on welfare or food stamps or some kind of public assistance. If conservatives come along and knock you off of that, you must go to the third level. You must steal, go into crime. Every individual must either work, go on welfare, or steal an elaboration, a combination, or sophistication of those three things. You can't do anything else unless you evaporate and disappear. We live in a society that won't understand it, don't want to play games about it, about how you're going to solve the unemployment problem. You cannot solve the unemployment problem unless you go back and address the real issues. Now, what are the real issues again back in 1860? You don't own and control enough wealth. Why? Because, you see, slavery did not happen to black folk by accident. It was inflicted on them intentionally to do something. What it was inflicted on blacks to do? It was intentionally inflicted on blacks to maldistribute almost 100% of all this nation's wealth, power, resource, businesses, income, and controls of all levels of government. That was the point of slavery. It has never been corrected or addressed. All of a sudden, when black folk came out of slavery in 1865, what, how did they come out? They came out penniless, poor. No food, no animals, no land, no resources, no tools, no religion, no organization, nothing. All they were told is go out and now you're free, go out and compete. Compete with what? Compete with what? They said, well, you can, uh, you can jump high and run faster. Black folk had nothing coming out of slavery to compete with and to play the game. Because you see, slavery has systematically, socially engineered them into the lowest level of a real life monopoly game. And see, prior to, to, to the end of the Civil War, the greatest wealth builder in this nation was the back of a slave. That's what built the wealth of the society. Wall Street was set up and established and regulated off of the price and the value of a slave. Cotton prices, indigo prices, tobacco prices, all followed the value of a slave. When slavery ended, the whole process shifted to the back of a slave. At the end of slavery, it shifted to Wall Street. And those became commodities then. And when, it, when, the, when the wealth building in this nation shifted from the back of a slave to Wall Street, 
they set up a new game. It was called Monopoly. Now, and what black folk have been systematically lowered into is a real-life Monopoly game. Now, the Monopoly game is based on some primary concepts. One is that you must be able to all sit down at the table, and everybody's supposed to get a fair share of the money. Once you get a fair share of the money, then you got a right to go around the table and try to buy land. But you want to buy the most valuable land and the best location of the land. Or you take your money and you buy basic businesses in, in the monopoly game, like the water company, electric company, and the railroad line. But you see, when black folk, when they got out of slavery, they did not get their 40 acres and a mule, nor the hundred dollars. And see, the, the Republican, uh, radical Republicans, the liberals in the Republican Party at that time, said, and that was Benjamin Thaddeus Stevens and Sumner said on the floor of the United States Congress, that there's only going to be one thing that black folk will ever be in America. They're either going to be slaves or they're going to be free. But they cannot be free unless minimally they have 40 acres, a mule, and $100. But they didn't get it. But by then they were trapped into a real life monopoly game. So now what blacks are doing is going around the real life, going around the real life board, trying to play real life monopoly with no money, no wealth. And all they do is go around the board to hope they land on free park or income tax refund. <laughs> and if you play that way, as sooner or later playing that real life game, you're going to land what? On the wrong person's property, and you're either going to go to jail or go broke and get out of the game. And that's why black folk right now are, out, are making a major impact on the prison system, the criminal system in this country. Because I looked around in 1860, for instance, I looked at all the major cities in the United States. And that's like Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Georgia, Savannah, Georgia, Richmond, Virginia, New York, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Brook. Guess what? Even though you had less than 300,000 black people that were free or quasi-free, black people made up over 51% of all the prisoners. 51% of all the prison, and out of 5 million, only 300,000 of you were even free. And here we are, 150 years later, and guess what? You still make up over 51% of the prisoners. So when I hear all my civil rights leaders and all my civil rights friends, I don't care what it's Al, Jesse, keep talking about, we've come a long way. You haven't gone any place. <laughs> and quit BSing people and bamboozing people and black folk about how far we've come. You haven't come any place. You're still sitting in the same identical spot. As my mother said, you haven't got a pot or one to throw it out of. That's why our dilemma. We do not have any wealth. Now, I indicated to you a few minutes ago that the whole process of slavery maldistributed almost 100% of all this nation's wealth, power, resource, privileges, and controls of all levels of government into the hands of the dominant white society. Now, what does that mean in tangible terms? That when you, when you only got one half of 1%, of the wealth. How can you compete with one half of 1% of the wealth? When in this society right now, today, 150 years later, the average white person in America as a group got 3,500 times more money than the average black person. The average white has 3,500 times more money than the average black. I got two whites right now, some of them I know, they got more wealth than all 42 million black people put together. How if two white men got more wealth than all 42 million black folk put together, oh, what kind of game are you playing? What are you going to do? How can you compete? As a matter of fact, let me move it off the men. Let's move it to gender. For every dollar that a, that a black woman has to run a household, the white woman has $100 to run a household. You're supposed to have enough money to be able to be self-sufficient. And this is true all around the world. Not just with blacks in this country. If I were to look, look at them, you got approximately 25 to 26 percent of the population is black around the earth. And you got over 300 trillion dollars in wealth on the earth. And out of that 300 trillion dollars, I take all the African countries, the Caribbean countries, and Latin America, put them together. You still have one half of one percent of the wealth out of 300 trillion. I go down to South Africa. And I've spoken in all these countries. I've had trade missions in Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, Bermuda, Barbados, all these, Venezuela, Colombia. I've been to all these countries, had of trade missions, representing presidents and governors. You can't compete in South Africa. In South Africa, with something like about 29 million blacks, as an example, as a comparative example, 29 million blacks in South Africa. You've got a little over 2 million whites. 
But guess what? They own almost 100% of all the wealth in Africa, the two million whites. As a matter of fact, in Africa, the De Beers family, one white family, the Beers family, owns over 50% of the whole wealth of Africa. That means all the gold, silver, chrome, balsite, magnesium, land, property, everything. And you want to know why they can't make it in Africa? They don't own and control anything. And so in America, if we're going to be a competitive group, we got to go back to what is the basic problem we can deal with? The biggest problem with blacks right now, they own no wealth. They control absolutely nothing. Not in the United States, not in Grand Rapids. I don't have to go around Grand Rapids find what you got. I can guarantee you right now what you have and don't have. Or when you go into any city, you figure out who owns the buildings, the big buildings, who owns the communication system, who owns the banks, who owns the railroads, the bus companies. That's where your power is. If you don't, if you don't control a sufficient amount of that, you are a guest, G-U-E-S-T. You have no power. They can do anything they want anytime you want them. So black folk don't have enough wealth to be a competitive group. You cannot compete. That's the first problem. Now that you know what the problem is, the problem is a lack of wealth. And I'm going to get later on and tell you how black folks are getting wealth. Now, this, what's the second problem? The second problem is you got impediments that have consistently been used and imposed on black folk to make sure they don't get any wealth. Not necessarily by whites, but what you have in this, in this society, we have a public policy, a public policy that went into effect in 1867 when the, when the, when the 15th Amendment was enacted. The 15th Amendment says black people can now run for a public office. You can now run for office, but they said you can run for office to be for a sheriff's office, a postal office, or you can even run for a Congress or a state legislator. But if you run for a public office and get into the public arena, there are some taboos that you cannot do. One, you cannot run for a public office as a black person and talk about black issues. Point one. Point two, you cannot come into in a public office and talk about groupism. You must always talk about individualism, individual achievement. And point three, you cannot come into a public office and try to hold the dominant white society accountable for slavery and what they've done to you for 500 years through Jim Crow segregation and slavery. That means you can't have reparations. Now, if any of you try to do it, you'll be charged with racism, a reverse racism. But nobody ever admits you cannot have a reverse racism unless you got a forward racism. And they don't understand what racism is. So when we start talking in a few minutes about solutions, Understand clearly that it is impossible in theory and practice for a black person to be a racist. It is totally, absolutely impossible. If I listen to the Fox Channel, I say, you can't be that stupid and go to college unless you got you're using Gorilla Glue and got a certificate for being stupid. <laughs> you cannot have a black person as a racist. All black people can do is react to racism. They can't get yeah, racist. Racism is a power concept, point one, and two, it's a group concept. To be able to be, to be a racist, you must belong to the group that has the power and the wealth. And, it must, and it's a group-based concept. I'm going to divert over for a second just to give you a little piece of information. Racism never existed on the earth until, until the 1500s, the same time capitalism came into effect. We'll talk about that also. Racism never existed. In, during the 1400s, European societies were devastated with crime, poverty, and diseases. And when Columbus came back and he discovered America, at that point in time, nine European nations said, let's now go and, and enrich ourselves in that third world country. And they decided then, based on slaves that had been brought to, to Henry the Navigator back in 1443 and given to him, they said, and, and the Pope then put out a public edict in 1888, I mean 1488, saying, if you're going to slave anybody, use what we've learned through the Catholic Church, these, these black slaves that Henry Navigator gave us, use them. And so everybody started going around the coast of Africa and picked up these blacks. And they were picking up these black people off the coast of Africa for about $25 a head. And they were bringing them to the, to the New World and selling them in for a $1,500 return on investment. And that prior to that time, the major form of, of commerce was called mercantilism. By 1509, it switched off. They started calling it capitalism. Now, this is very important for you all to start learning if you're going to do, do something in this city. Capitalism, in the simplest definition, in the 1500s, it says learning, inquiring, own, and control the land, the tools, the resources, and use other people's labor to enrich yourself. That's what capitalism is. I'm going to tell it to you again. It means learn how to acquire 
and control and own the land, the resources and tools, and use other people's labor to enrich itself. That's capitalism. Now, W.D. Du Bois defined it a little different in 1915. He said that capitalism is like having three to four years of corn. You eat one, you save one, you sell one, and you save the seeds for next year's planting. That's capitalism. Now, in that, neither of those definitions did any of y'all hear me, and correct me if you heard it. I didn't mention anything about civil rights and social integration. I said it's learning how to acquire wealth, tools, resources, and, and enrich yourself off of it. But what has happened now in the black community is through impediments is that we've been bamboozled by a lot of the black leadership in this country to having black folk focus strictly on civil rights and social integration. Social integration has failed in this country for black folk. It's the worst thing that ever happened to black folk. Black folk went backwards with social integration. It, what black folk lost almost everything they had during the process of social integration. Before integration came, and most of my white friends, and again when I say white friends, see I got white relatives, y'all might not know that. <laughs> and see they jump on me all the time, but you know I quit saying those things about us. We're not part of that. But I got half my family want to pass white, I go on fine, do it. But see, but social integration, integration is a diluting process. It's a watering down process. And before integration, black people in America had, they had their own businesses. They had their own communities. They had their own schools and churches. They had their, as a matter of fact, in the west of Salem, North Carolina, where I grew up, my family was one of the families that was a part owner of a four family operation. We own the only black bus line in America. The only one they've ever had. When I say a bus line, I'm not talking about three or four buses or 10 or 15 buses. We had over 500 buses. We didn't service just the black neighborhood. We serviced the white neighborhoods too. It was called the Safe Bus Company in Western Salem, North Carolina. We took care of the city bus services. In Western Salem, the black community also had two cab companies. Why? Because the white community had two cab companies. The white community had the Bluebird and the Yellow Cabs. Blacks, we had, the, we, had the, we had the Harris Cab and the Camel City Cabs. We had our own movie theaters, the Lincoln and Lafayette Theaters. They had theirs, the Hollywood, the North Carolina Theaters, the State Theaters. We had our own um, restaurants and shoe shops and clothing stores and everything. We lost all of that. We even had our own movie producer theaters. We had the Lincoln and Lafayette theaters. In every city in the United States, blacks had the two movie theaters, the Lincoln and Lafayette theaters. We had movie producing studios, Norman Productions down in Jacksonville, Florida, Rishaw in Chicago, and Hollywood Productions making our own movies. They weren't the best movies, but they were ours. <laughs> but see, when integration came, it took away everything from us. And unfortunately, it wasn't because it was conspiracy of whites to do that. It wasn't the whites that did that. It was the NAACP. Now, don't go blaming whites for that. Whites didn't jump up this idea about let's go out and, and put poor, forced blacks into integration. You see, when down in McLaren, South Carolina, where I used to live, in McLaren, South Carolina, they filed an original lawsuit that became the desegregation decision in 1954. They weren't filing it for social integration. They filed it because the black kids were walking to school every day and the white kids were riding on buses. And in my school, in elementary school, we had to spend the first week every year of school cleaning up the old books. The white schools would send all the old books over to our school. We had to clean them and fix them up and take gum, erase them, get all the dirt and trash off and put tape on them. We got all their hand-me-downs of everything for equipment, tools, everything. And so when, they, so when Clinton, South Carolina filed a lawsuit, they filed it based on what? Money, economics. They're saying it's not right. We don't want so, they've been talking about social integration. The city and the state, was the county, was paying what? One dollar for every black child to go to school and eleven dollars for every white child to go to school. And that's where the problem came from. It was a mal, it was a maldistribution of the resources and the money. And so in 1970, Governor Reuben Askew, who's a good old Southern who I love to death, Reuben called me down and said, Dr. Anson, would you come down here and run my schools, run the state system? I became the coordinator of education for the state of Florida from 1970 to 1976, right at the time of desegregation. And I went to the Department of Education and I said, look, I said, what, what are y'all, how you, what are y'all going to do on the desegregation decision? They said, well, what we're going to do, here's our plan. We're going to close, we're going to fire the black teachers, fire the black counselors, fire the black administrators, close all the black schools, bus 75% of the black kids to the white schools, and put the rest in special education classes. I said, no, you're not going to do that. And they said, why not? I said, I don't want you to bust the kids, I want you to bust the money and the resources. 
Leave the black neighborhood, the black schools alone, and bust the resources over there. Give them some tennis courts. Give them some swimming pools. Give them some of the best teachers and best books and, 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 and learning materials. But again, I got overruled in that by the state legislature. They said the easiest thing for them, they could save money by just letting blacks become guests, G-U-E-S-T, in the white schools. And so consequently, that didn't work. And so, what we had, so we had pediments because our civil rights leaders got bamboozled with that policy in 1867. Then by, 19, by 1968, it came up again. President Nixon then, got a, when he got elected to office, he got a letter from Daniel Monaghan saying, I got a way to shut down the black civil rights movement in the country and shut down the black power movement. He said, what you do, you take the focus in public policy off of black folk and never put it back again. You place it on minority women and immigrants. And so at that point, I was opposed to that, but that's what they did. They shifted the focus. And they call that a benign neglect policy, which means that don't say anything mean about black folk, just pretend that they don't exist. And then they come up with this whole concept called post-racism and a colorblind society. And say the Constitution is colorblind. The Constitution was never colorblind. The Constitution was always very specific, saying you all going to be slaves and you all can be owners. The Constitution was never colorblind. And the American dream, what you hear about all the time, was based on anybody coming from Europe. They were advertising all over Europe, come to America and we give you free land and free labor. And they set up a franchising system to make sure anybody came to America and get free land and free labor. Black folk, again, were not in the system. They were underneath the system. They never got the free land. They never got free labor. They were the labor force. And so by the 1960s, when, when Man Monaghan's memo went out, blacks were an obsolete, abandoned labor class. Our black civil rights leaders bought into the concept of focusing now not on black folk, but on minority women and children, people of color, multicultural, diversity, anything other than black folk. Now it's moved over to gay and transsexuals. Now I have the dubious honor again. I wrote the first affirmative action plan in the United States. I wrote that in 1970. I wrote it for the state of Florida, approved by Governor Askew and the state cabinet. I didn't write the affirmative action program for everybody. And if I were a white male right now, I'd be mad as hell because the affirmative action plan was not written for everybody. It was written for black people. It was written for a very specific reason. It was written to be corrective action, correcting something that the government has systematically done to handicap, exploit, misuse, enslave, and beat up on a specific group of people and deny them access to resources. But the Monaghan memo, with a lot of our civil rights leaders supporting it, switched it away from black folk and switched it to everybody can now be called a minority and everybody entitled to the same benefits. If you're an immigrant that ran across the border last night, you're entitled to the benefits. That's not, you're not, that's, that's not what it was designed for. Nobody used these broad, ambiguous terms. Minority, what is a minority? Nobody knows, is that a one-legged man, a plant piano, blind piano player? What's a, one, what's a minority? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what a minority is. Nobody knows what a people of color is. So when he moved into all these broad languages that you cannot measure, you can't identify, doesn't mean anything. And see, if I were a white male right now, I would go get into a minority program. You know why? Because the white male is one of the biggest minorities in the country. He's entitled to go into every minority program you got and get what he needs out of it. We had a Pakistani that came up to Washington, D.C. The University of Maryland did the same thing. He was a Pakistani. He went through Africa and came into the United States, and he said he was an African-American. The scholarship program was set up for African Americans. He says, I'm an African American. I, I left Africa and I'm in America. <laughs> and he's absolutely right. And, and, and all my white friends right here, over here, over here, you know, all, see all these, all of these are African Americans. You know why? Because the first human beings on earth were in Africa. All people radiated out of Africa. Every white person is an African American if he lives in America. He's got, he's got African blood in him. He might be going back some, uh, quite a distance. And a lot of us even closer than that in some, in our, in, back in the 1880s. So everybody's an African-American. Nobody knows what it is. You can't measure it. And so when, when, we, when we get through the civil rights movement, they ask them, some blacks, what do y'all want? What are you marching for? What do you want? And our civil rights leaders uh, incompetently said, we want something that we can't measure. We want equal opportunity. And so the white community says, abracadabra, you got it. What else do you all want? They say, well, we want equality. They say, abracadabra, you got it. 
They said, well, what else you want? We want freedom. They said, abracadabra, you got it. Now get the hell out of here and don't come back anymore. <laughs> they didn't get anything. The Civil Rights Movement got nothing. And every time they got a march, they're marching to Washington, you can ask them, what is it that you're marching for? They're not marching for anything. There's no connection between them marching and getting benefits. And I'm, I'm not going to run out of my time, so I'm going to start getting talk about some solutions. I, don't, I lost track of my time, how much time I got. They only gave me a half an hour. Am I okay? Oh, he said, I got, I got the time. Okay. So, so what I'm saying to you is that we got to stay away from these very broad, ambiguous terms. Because these very broad, ambiguous terms have been used by our own people, not whites, but black organizations, to stifle and bamboozle their own people. I'm sorry to say that because most of them are my friends. And I go to them. I said, come here a minute. I said, come here a minute, son. I said, what are you? He said, who are you with? He said, I'm with the NAACP. I said, what's your goal and objective? Who you, who you represent? He said, I represent poor people and minorities. I said, okay. I go to my friends in the Urban League up there in Washington. I said, who do you represent? He said, we represent diversity and multicultural. I go to Jesse and I said, who do you represent? He said, I represent the rainbow. I said, well, who in the hell represents black folk? <laughs> Nobody. You have no leadership. You have no leadership. Nobody's representing you. Black folk have been abandoned. And, I, and, and even, even I did, my, did the power economics, the black labor study. I did a study in 1960. And then 1960, we had approximately 103 black elected officials in the entire United States. I did a social discomfort indicator study to find out what the conditions were of, of black folk were in, 18, in 1960. I looked at the an unemployment rate, the dysfunctional schools, dysfunctional family, a joblessness, unemployment, income, everything, medium family income. Then I waited 30 years until 1990 and did the exact same study to see what had happened. Why? Because in 1990, 30 years later, black folks' number of representatives in elected office has gone up over 9,000%. I say if black folk have gone from 103 elected officials to 9,000, boy, we must be doing well in the country. I did the same exact study, discomfort indicator study, and found out that not only didn't black folks progress, guess what? They went backwards. They went backwards because there's no connection between putting a black person in office and getting benefits. None of them are going to do it. As soon as a black person gets elected to office, the first thing he's going to do is violate the sworn oath he just took. He has sworn it over and say, I'm sworn to get in the office to represent those people who elected me to office and serve them. As soon as a black person gets to office, the first thing I say is that I'm here to take care of everybody. And so you have no representation. And when I got out of politics, that's why I said I quit. And I ran the campaigns for, as I said, for presidents, for governors, for attorney generals, and for congressmen and state legislators and mayors. I wasn't in the campaign. I was the campaign manager for them. I have never run into a black person yet who says, I'm going to represent my own people and take care of them once I get in office. They won't do it. That's not white people against you. It's your own people who won't do the things they're supposed to do for you. When Maurice Farade, the mayor of Miami, and Mary Steerheimer, the, 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 the uh, county manager down in Miami, in Dade County, says, Dr. Hans, would you please come down here and uh, help us in Miami? We had, we had three race riots down there since the 1960s. Come down here and help us stop some of these problems. And, uh, and, uh, and I, said, you, I said, you got a black city manager down there, Howard Gary now. He's in Jet Magazine every week bragging about he's the only black city manager in America. Why don't you ask him to do something? They said, well, well, would you come down and help us? So what I did, I gave him, I provided $10 million for him. I took $9 million out of, the, out of a fund for the Department of Commerce and, one, and another million from the Department of Labor and set up a revolving loan fund in Miami called Miami Citywide and Miami Capital and sent it down there so, they can, so black people can go in and get access to money to start businesses in the city of Miami. That money went down like in October. When I went down there, when I got down there, then they called me and said, why didn't work? And I said, why? They said, you had to come down and check. I went down and checked, and Cubans had taken it over by June. And they had put out 27 loans to Cubans, took, took the program from the blacks. So, this, so, so my white friends, Mayor Maurice Ray, who good buddy, and Mayor Sarah, I said, come down and help us. I went down there, and I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I said, why don't the city manager do something? He said, you go talk to him. I went over to Howard Gary, the city manager in Miami. 
And I met him in front of the, front of the city hall. And I said, Howard, why don't you do something to help these black folk? Look at all these houses are slum infested. They're leaning and falling down. People standing on rocks to get in the house. Rats running all over the place. I walked into them. You can see the up, all the way upstairs, a big hole, all the way up to the toilets and the bathrooms up next door. Do something to these people. Give them some jobs. And why don't you help black folk? He said, Dr. Anson, let's get one thing straight. He said, I am not a black city manager. He says, I am a good city manager. And why should I go out of my way to offend whites and Hispanics and Cubans to do something for black folk? I said, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. But I said, the first chance I get, I'm taking you out of this office. You can count on that. And by 1988, I had him out of there. Because you see, black people don't want to help their own people. And that's why I'm so proud of this black chamber of commerce to say, we're going to go in and start doing something for black folk, not to hurt anybody else. Now, how do you do it? You go back to the basic problem, which is lack of wealth. Now, black folk got almost near getting near close to about a trillion dollars in wealth now. A million dollars in wealth. A billion dollars in wealth. What you need to do now, what you have to do is to figure out how to tap that money and hold it. Black folk right now, annual disposable income makes them about the ninth richest nation on earth. But the reason that black folk are so impoverished and poor in this city and all these other cities, they don't practice group economics. They can't practice group economics. Why? Because they don't have communities. Integration destroyed their communities. Now, when I go across America, I go to every city, and they, I cannot find not one single black community in America. All you got in America are black neighborhoods. A black neighborhood is totally, absolutely useless. A black neighborhood is where you eat and sleep. The Holiday Inn, the Marriott, is a neighborhood. You don't have any black community. Not one black community in America. To have a black community, you must qualify with three things you must have. You must have a wholly independent economic structure. You must have a code of conduct. You must have people in elected office to represent you. They have to be qualified as a community. I go across America, I can't find one. I get into California, I can find Chinatown, Japan towns, little Cambodia, little Saigon, Korea towns, little Mexican towns. I can find little Havana's, High Lear, Cork town, Pork towns, little Italy's, little Italian, Greek towns. But I can't find a black town any place in the country. If you don't have, if you don't have a, a community, you can't play the game in, in real life monopoly. You cannot practice monopoly in this town unless you all build a community. You got to build a community. And the community, if you can't build a community, you got to build a sense of a community. And I go up to, I go up to, up to uh, Philadelphia and talk to my Italian friends. All of them don't live in Little Italy anymore. They identify with Little, with little Italy and come down and support it and buy from it in stores and businesses. Now all the other groups, they do that naturally and instinctively. You got to set up this town right now, and I want the Chamber of Commerce to start doing this, to get all their organizations to learn how to start training black kids how to produce wealth. It is wealth that determines your equal opportunities. Your wealth determines where you can go and where you can't go. Civil rights and, and socialism gets you nothing. It is what you own and control that will determine your, your competitiveness. I got five fingers, t ten minutes, okay. Let me move a little faster then. I know I'm talking too fast for you all now, but, okay. but you, got, you got to build a community. And it could be build a business community someplace in this town. Go find a decent street someplace where you got a good traffic flow that is not being properly and sufficiently used. Block it off and say, in, in, in your mind and say, we're going to take and develop this area. Why? To take the burden off the rest of society for paying for our food stamps and welfare. We just are generating our own income and wealth. Okay? <laughs> You build, you, you get, you, you pick that block. Then you call, you get a big assembly like this and call every black you know in, in Grand Rapids here. Every black. You divide them up in, in the room. You put all the blacks that own businesses on this side of the room, all those want to go in business on this side of the room. You tell out and you ask all those on the, in, already in business, say, look, how many of you would be willing to relocate your business where it is now in, the, in our business community? And get them to make a commitment to relocate if you build a black community there. Then you go to this side and say, how many of you all want to go into business and provide businesses that we currently don't have? How many of you will open up a gas station, a cleaners, a grocery store, a drug store, and move into that community? <laughs> and get a commitment out of them. Then you, then, you, then you go to your politicians and say, I want you to support this. And we're going to mark this as a black business district where black folk can practice group economics. Your money must bounce. If you're going to be competitive in, a, in playing real life monopoly, your money must bounce eight to 12 times before it leaves your hands. Now, typically, Hispanic money bounces six to seven times. 
uh, white money bounces eight to 12 times. Asian and, and, and Arab money bounces 12 to 13 times. Jewish money bounces 18 times. Black money doesn't bounce once. The danger zone in this world right now in any city is to get between, a, on payday, to get between where a black person is working and getting paid and getting to a mall. You'll get run over, that's as fast as hell because they're gonna go straight to that mall with the money. They don't bounce the money. They don't buy from their own people and circulate the money. The money must bounce around. And that's, what, that's the problem in Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan right now, they had a, they had a, a budget up there of something like about seven, eight billion dollars. They had another two billion in school and black folk were circulating about another four or five billion dollars. If they had circulated 10 to 12 times, they would have had like 300 billion dollars to run that city. But all of them go right across Eight Mile Road and drop their money. And, that, and, they, and they produce no income, and no jobs, no services, no goods, no tax base for their own people. They provide it for the suburbs. The suburbs love that. So now Detroit is poor and impoverished because its money went outside the community. And if you want to be able to save this city and help this city at the same time, learn how to buy from your own people. And mere fact, I got to tell you to buy black means there's a problem. Everybody else knows that. Go right now, I bet you, not on this town, I can go right now and find a Hispanic community. I can find an Arab community. They will buy from their own people. Bio people don't have trust. They don't have trust. They don't trust each other. You can't trust each other if you don't have a community. A community comes first. Once you get a community and you get to know people, then you move up to the next level, you trust them. Once you learn how to trust people, then you move up to the third level, you begin to cooperate with them. And once you learn how to cooperate with them, then you get to the fourth level and you start holding them accountable for what they're doing wrong. The same thing in business. In business, you build a, a, a business operation and competitiveness and power dynamics is a five-story building. The first thing you all should be doing, as I said, get you some institutions like the chamber and started teaching, acquiring health, uh, well, wealth and power through operating businesses. If you build an economy, that's a five-story building. The first floor must always be economics. Always build an economy before you do everything else. The first floor is the economy. The second floor is politics. The third floor is the court and police departments, the enforcement system. The fourth floor is the media. The fifth floor is schools. Now again, you've been bamboozled on that because they keep telling you that if you go to, go to send black folks to school, go up, jump to the fifth floor and try to come back down. Education can't do nothing. Education is just a tool. You start with your economy. Once you build an economy, a viable, competitive economy by making your money circulate eight to 12 times, you take that money and you move to the second floor. The second floor is your politicians. Don't worry about voting. You don't have to vote. People that got money, whether it's organized crime or wealthy people, they don't have to vote. You take your money on the first floor and you buy every politician on the second floor. <laughs> If you can't buy them, you rent or lease them. <laughs> and once you rent or lease those politicians, or buy them on the second floor, you make hold them accountable to go to the third floor. And you stop the police from shooting and killing black folk all the time. And come up with new codes of conduct. Then once you get to the third floor and get, and get, the, and get the police and court stress them straight because you can now effectuate it, then you go to the fourth floor. The fourth floor means media. You cannot own television stations, radio stations, and daily newspapers if you don't have an economy. I hear black folk crying all the time. I have two radio stations. I used to have four. You cannot have a, a media operation unless you have an economy. Who's going to buy your time, your ads? You got to have an economy to buy the time. And so you got to, you got to, right now we have 12,000 radio stations in the United States. We got about uh, 12,000 cable systems, 5,000 daily newspapers, 5,000 TV stations. Black folk own 35 thousandths of 1%. You can't even communicate. You can't communicate, you can't organize. You can't get communication because you don't have an economy. And once you get, get enough money, you put your medium up at the, up at the fourth floor. Then lastly, you tell the, fourth, the fifth floor, which is a school system, say, here's what we want. We don't want any more black basketball players and football players. Every black right now, a successful black, has got some kind of an illicit relationship with a ball. <laughs> he's either running with a tennis ball, basketball, golf ball, football, setting on jokes, telling jokes, pretending he's having a ball. Just get, up, get away from that and say, from now on, you try to raise kids that can produce something. The producers will be the people survive. Right now, black folk are zero producers and 100% consumers. You're gonna to get totally wiped out in this country and wiped off the face of the earth under globalization if you don't learn how to produce. 
And, you, and once you start producing, do it vertically. You produce something at the bottom level, then you go up and have other blacks come in over you. If I, like I'm producing fish, a million pounds of fish a year, I want blacks to come in and warehouse, wholesale, distributor, then retail. I want to see some black lobster restaurants in the country. And you, and you build, and I had about two more minutes I got. Now, and you, and you, build these, you build these vertical orders based on your competitive advantages. Start build your businesses where you have a competitive advantage. What are your competitive advantages, black folk? Always build your business where you dominate in population or you dominate in spending patterns. I, went, I built the seafood factories, why? Because blacks eat three to four times more seafood than whites and you spend nine dollars for every one dollar white spend. You should be controlling the seafood industry. Do the same thing with leather. You do the same thing with your hair. Right now, blacks are the only people got, got a certain quality of hair and yet the Koreans are controlling black hair care in America. And you watch you build these businesses like the difference between Detroit and Chinatown. You got it in, in, in Chinatown in New York. In Chinatown, New York, they got about a little less than 300,000 Chinese there. And again, in Detroit, you got almost a, had almost a million blacks. I looked at the two and compared them. What, in, in Chinatown, they had, they had 35 banks, 35 Asian banks. In Detroit, they got two black banks, and that's owned by the same one. How is it that, that uh, me, almost a million people don't have two banks and 300,000 will have 35 banks? I looked at the number of restaurants. The Asians had almost 400 some restaurants in, the, in New York. Black folk in Detroit had three. I looked at it and I said, how do how these Asians producing so well and have so much, and they got, and Asians have the highest median family income in America. Here's what they do in conclusion. They, 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 they build around their advantage. What is it that Asians eat the most of? They eat noodles. I went and found something like about, about 100 and some noodle factories in New York where they produce their own noodles. Now, once they produce the noodles, what do you put on the noodles? They put a sauce on the noodles. I, had a, I found about another 60 or 70 companies that produce the sauce to go on the noodles. And I said, what else are they producing? Then when I found that they had, I don't know how many, 35 or 40 companies that made the little fortune cookies. They take care of their own people. That's why you'll never see Asians, Arabs, Hispanic, or American Indians out marching for integration or for social civil rights. They don't do it. They build businesses. I love you all. Take care.